Welcome to City Church. We are a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus, grow together, and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter, and uh, I don't work or live in Charlottesville, actually. Um, I work and live as a teacher and a chaplain at Christ School in um, Asheville, North Carolina, in a suburb of Asheville, to the extent that that's possible. Um, but, but I have and do wear many hats at this church. First, I was just a pastor's child, and then I was, you know, like official chair straightener and baptismal fountain war water warmer upper and um, official annoyer of Chris Becker for a while because I used to play drums during work hours. And, um, uh, and now I am preaching. <laughs> uh, I did, as I remind people, go to seminary. It's not just pastor's kid privilege, though I am a spoiled rotten brat that allows me to preach here. So um, if I haven't met you, I would love to meet you. If I have met you... We'll always have that special time together. Um, so this year at City Church, we are doing the Sermon on the Mount, which is great for a couple reasons. Last year, we did the Year of the Kingdom, which in some sense is Jesus' central concept. If you were to ask him, hey, big guy, what are you about? He would say, ah, oh, the kingdom of God. It's so close. And if you then wanted to follow up with, well, okay, so how am I supposed to get involved? That would be, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, many um, kind of major thinkers in the Christian tradition, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the Quakers, would sort of tell you that this is the core of the New Testament, the Sermon on the Mount, at least to the extent of its teaching. The, new, the Sermon on the Mount is kind of the ember that you blow on if you want to start the wildfire of the rest of the gospel. And the way Matthew is setting up the Sermon on the Mount, and we've done this, my dad's done this the last couple of weeks, the way Matthew is setting up the Sermon on the Mount, where he puts it in his story, is really, really deliberate. So once upon a time, there was a man named Jesus, and he was born, and he was born under the reign of a crazy king who tried to kill him. And then his parents had to uh, escape with him into Egypt, and then, and then he re-arrives, although no one really mentions what happens to him in Egypt, and then he gets baptized in the Jordan River, and then he wanders for 40 days in the desert, and then he gives this big spiel, the Sermon on the Mount. Not unlike this other guy named Moses, who was born in Egypt to a crazy king whose parents had to like smuggle him around, who then left for a little while and then came back and then he led the people of Egypt across the Red Sea and then he wandered in the desert for 40 years. Then he stood up and he gave the law. Very creepy, no? And the point that Matthew's trying to make is that Jesus is a new Moses with a new law for a new people. If, you, if you're going to follow Jesus and you want to be part of what has historically been called the body of Christ, this is his manifesto. This is how he teaches you to do that. And um, it's, it's kind of his central philosophy. It's his central framework. It's his... You're supposed to soak in this and marinate in this. This is supposed to get in your bones. I've got this friend whose dad is a vineyard pastor. And if you ask... Pastor Willison, to mentor you, he will say, go memorize the Sermon on the Mount, and if you come back and have it memorized, I'll mentor you. And he has like no mentees. <laughs> um, I don't mean to get all up in your business, but I do mean to get a little in your business. If you can tell me more about the best political philosophy out there, if you can talk to me for a whole dinner party about capitalism and why it's the best thing ever, if you can spend a whole afternoon ranting to me about socialism and its evils or socialism and its goods, if you can convince me that conservatism is the way this country will be saved or liberalism is this way this country will be saved, and you can't tell me much about the Sermon on the Mount, you have a problem and you're in the right year-long sermon series. So congratulations. Also... If you can tell me why lots of other people have avoided the Sermon on the Mount, you should read that little bit about the log and the speck. So, this is meant to be a profoundly challenging, life-consuming, ethically fundamental, in some sense, uncompromising body of teachings from Jesus. 
I think most of us who are here of our own accord go to church because we hope that at the end of the day, the people of Jesus will be different, that between us, it will be different than it is out there, and this is how you learn to be different. You take the Sermon on the Mount seriously, you get it into your bones, you make it your first literary reference, and then you go and live it. That's first and foremost how we become different. This is how we're taught to be the people of God. And when Jesus does that, he starts it off with this chunk of sayings called the Beatitudes. Now, you can have this for free. They're called the Beatitudes because in Latin, the word for blessed is beatus. And so in the Latin translation, Jesus would say, beato, uh, plural, beati, this, that, no, no, blessed, 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 blessed. In Greek, the word is makarioi, which means blessed, but really means kind of like happy. So when Eugene Peterson translated the message, and I know I'm not supposed to like the message because I went to seminary, but I kind of love the message. When Eugene Peterson translated the message, he tried to get the word lucky through here. And the editors thought it was probably too sacrilegious. But he was trying to make a point, and the point stands that this word blessed is not the word used in the Torah for the announcement of a blessing. It's a different word. It's also a different word in Greek, elogos. But here, makarioi is meant to be like happy or almost happy-go-lucky. And so Jesus gives these series of sayings. This person's blessed, that person's blessed, that person's blessed. Now, I don't know about you. It always annoys me when people say that in sermons. I can't believe I just did it. I don't know about you, but when I read, when I have read the Beatitudes, oftentimes my first thought is that they are a manual to getting blessed. So it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And you're like, oh, I want to be blessed. I guess I got to go be poor in spirit, whatever that means, or like blessed are those who mourn. And then you're starting to go, I might not want to be blessed, actually, now that I think about it. Blessed are the meek. No, thank you. But in fact, what Jesus is not doing is giving you a manual how to be blessed. He's trying to convince you that there is a way of seeing the world that's vitally important. I picked up an unnamed parent of mine from a colonoscopy some time ago. And I, of course, then got interested in what happens in a colonoscopy because I thought they just stick a tube 17,000 feet up your behind parts. <laughs> but after watching a lot of Katie Couric and several filmed colonoscopies, I've learned a couple things. One, not so scary. Two, you're asleep the whole time. And three, when they put the little guy in the helmet into your colon, no, I'm just kidding. When they put the camera in your colon, they're looking around for polyps very scary. And when they find a polyp, they throw different kinds of light on it. So if you, you know, watched a filmed colonoscopy, you would see that the little polyp is like green and then red and then yellow and then green. And it was explained to me by the woman in the film that they do this because you can possibly tell if a polyp is cancerous based on how it reflects the light. What do you know? You throw different kinds of light on the flesh, so I'm told, in the attempt to figure out what's really going on there. That's what the Beatitudes are like, a colonoscopy. No, the Beatitudes, <laughs> the Beatitudes are like, are Jesus asking you to, when you see something, like, think of it this way. When you see meekness in the world, how about instead of seeing someone as a loser, you think of them as someone positioned where the kingdom of God is coming. What if you think of it that way? How about when you see mourners, you think of them as a crack in the wall of the world where the light of the kingdom of heaven is shining through. So blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And this week's beatitude Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, what I'd love to do is tell you that um, I know exactly what mercy means. But I've been looking into it. It's a complicated thing. So in the ancient Greco-Roman world, mercy was sort of a feeling. It was like the gut reaction to 
seeing human suffering or in some sense to, um, to like the plea of a desperate person. So if Jean Valjean comes to you and is like, hasta le loaf of bread, but only to feed my children, you're supposed to go like, ah, oh, Jean Valjean. That fi- that's mercy. In fact, the Stoics, if you know these people, they didn't like it because they thought it was too painful an emotion. Well, they didn't like emotions at all. Anyway, and then in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, it's used several times. And what I would love to do is stand up here and give you the like, well, the Hebrew word is, but let me tell you a little bit. This is for free. If you're gonna zone out in this sermon, zone out now. In the old, uh, when, when Greek became the predominant language of the Mediterranean, uh, a, a collection of Jews by tradition in Alexandria translated the Tanakh, the whole Old Testament into Greek. And so if you want to know the the Old Testament background to a New Testament word, you get the Greek word from the New Testament, and then you run it through the Septuagint, which is that translation. And if you run the word eleos, mercy, through the Septuagint, annoyingly, you find that it stands in for several words, like compassion, racham, or God's covenant faithfulness, chesed, and like three more. And it's used hundreds and hundreds of times. So, so when we talk about what mercy is in the Old Testament, you're trying to uh, go stuff together all these different words. And to the best that the Kittel Theological Dictionary of the New Testament can do is to say that in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, mercy is something like action in a concrete relationship. It's a doing. Oftentimes, God is said to have mercy or be merciful, not because God is portrayed as feeling something, but because God does something. God commits to somebody. God makes things right. God takes pity on someone. And in all our culture, to the best that I can tell, mercy, I think, is when someone does, decides not to use the power rightfully given to them over someone who has genuinely done wrong. That's what I think mercy looks like. In, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, it's an emotion. In, in the context of the Tanakh, in the history of Israel, it's an action. And in our culture, it's a decision, kind of. And when I, when I read the blessed are the merciful part of this, you know, at first bit, it doesn't sound as bad as the other Beatitudes, you know what I mean? It's like, blessed are those who mourn. Mourning, not so good. Or the meek. If I ever heard someone call me meek, I would cry in the bathroom, you know what I mean? <laughs> but merciful, ah, I, you know, merciful you can maybe do. Except, as I've thought about it this week and prayed over it some, um, what's, what's been called to mind for me is how much we like to receive mercy. I'm very pro receiving mercy. I need it all the time. I am often haunted by my own flagrant incompetence, as I'm sure you are too, no offense. I'm down for receiving mercy, and I also love mercy in literature when I can see the whole picture. So again, like in Les Mis, you know what I mean? Jean Valjean, bad, bad thief. Actually, not so bad a thief, but you know he's not so bad a thief. That's part of the kicker. You know he's secretly a good guy because the narrator told you. And then he steals the silver from a priest because he's desperate. And when the, when the police bring him back to the police, he goes, the, the priest goes, oh, you forgot the best part. Here's the candlesticks. And we're reading it and we're like, yes! The man who has such a pure heart of gold is, have, is given mercy by the priest. And then in the end, it turns out amazing because he became such a good guy. Except for the fact that you basically never get that point of view in real life. It is so hard, if possible at all, to like peer into the heart of somebody. And, and then to keep up with them long enough to know that they have morally been renovated because you let them steal from you. In fact, it seems to me like we are quite bad precisely at what Jesus is asking us to do, which is to see, to see mercy as blessedness. It's much easier to see mercy as weakness. You didn't punish someone because you didn't have the backbone to, pub- to punish somebody. Or even to see mercy as morally irresponsible. So um, I have one particularly frustrating class that I teach, and I think often about how I could punish them. And... <laughs> I am, I don't enjoy their pain. I don't like disciplining them. So they get away with a lot of stuff because I am merciful. (laughs) But as I let them turn in weeks of homework late, I think to myself, is this like the right thing to do? 
like, shouldn't I be like somehow reprimanding them? Because I don't want to set a bad example and I don't want them to learn that they can get away with things. Like I don't want to, like the showing of mercy is actually not, is routinely not considered blessed. It's weak or naive or morally reprehensible. And yet this is what Jesus is asking us to do is when you look around the world to see mercy as, as blessedness. So far as I can tell, there is one context in which these beatitudes really are true, where the poor in spirit should be happy, where those who mourn should be happy, or those who hunger should be happy. And it's if the kingdom of God really is really coming into the world. If there really is some resolution, some salvation, some setting right to all of this stuff in Jesus' life and in his career. Um, I've got a friend who I don't think it would be appropriate to name, but when I think about the most merciful person I know, he comes to mind. And if you take a second, you can also probably bring the most merciful person you know to mind. And I know my friend pretty well. So I, 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 I know um, how his parents treated him when he was young. And um, I, I know a lot about the cancer battle that ended his first marriage. And I know some about the struggles he's had with his kids and the struggle he has with his kids, which have gone on much longer than anybody really would have thought. Um, and I know what he thinks about his, this stage of his career, which is also not what he had planned. And I know how people have treated him, which is appalling, because I think of him as this incredibly merciful guy, but people say things. And I, and I have some sense that his mercy comes in large part out of his pain. And I think of other people I know for whom um, most things have gone well and how unmerciful they routinely, they routinely seem to be. And when I think about my friend, and I wonder if when you also think about your friends who are merciful, and the giant sack of pain that they carry for themselves, that you also do not start to hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God, for a place where people are given mercy because they have been merciful, sometimes in spite of the remarkable pain and harm that has been done to them, where mercy can be set right in its own way, where people who are willing to be merciful and so not to guard their own advantage, not to watch their own back, not to always assert their way, not to always assert their will, not to always feel they need to prove and show themselves. When those people finally have a defendant in the living God, in whose kingdom they will no longer have to worry about themselves. When I think about my friend and a couple other friends like him, I do think he would be blessed if the kingdom of God were really coming to him, coming for him, coming for all of us. Jesus' command to you, also to me, in this Sermon on the Mount, this first chunk of the Sermon on the Mount is to see the world a different way, is to shine the light of the Beatitudes on it. It's a discipline to learn to teach you to see the kingdom of God coming. If you can see those who mourn as blessed, the poor in spirit as blessed, farther down, when people revile and persecute you, when you're persecuted for it, if you can see all of that stuff, as not unqualified evil, disadvantage, but as the step before the moment when the kingdom of God breaks into the world and sets this all right. Well, then we're starting to see like Jesus, and who knows how you will act when you see the world that way. If there's some feet to your faith for this, there's one little tool that I could offer you that comes from the tradition of St. Ignatius of Loyola, a former soldier who was wounded long enough to become a Christian. He finally started reading and discovered there was really something to this whole religion stuff. And he had a very disciplined way of seeing the world. And, and so the monks in his order, they have to do something called the examine. 
And there's several ways to do the examine, but the easiest is to kind of sit by your bed at night at the end of the day and to become aware of God's presence. You can find this on ignatianspirituality.com if you're wondering. To sit at your bed at the end of the day to become cognizant of God's presence and to review the day with gratitude. And you look for those moments where gratitude does not come easily. And you pray through those. And then you look forward to tomorrow. What if you did that? Asking the question, where did I see mercy today and what did I think about it? When I saw someone else show mercy, did I think they were weak and naive? Did I think they were morally irresponsible? Or can I see that as a precursor to the kingdom of God coming? One last thought, and then, uh, and then we'll close. Um, I've wondered what holds the Beatitudes together for a little while, and I have a theory. I won't say God told me, because then you'd have to believe it, but this is a thought. Maybe what holds the Beatitudes together is that they are all attributes of God, as revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, we don't often think that way because we like God to be big and strong. God is omnipresent, omniscient, and all-powerful. God is omnicompetent. God is omni-omni. And we we like a God who comes in there and knocks things down and builds stuff up and... Except this is very much not the God who is revealed in Jesus. Jesus was a man of no great means, in his life of no particularly large international reputation, who could not escape death, who was abandoned by his friends, a man who wept in public and was despised by people who knew him. Jesus in so many ways lives into and through, represents and reveals God precisely in the unwanted attributes of the Beatitudes. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian who I love very dearly, in a letter to his friend near the end of his life wrote this, Christ helps us not by virtue of his omnipotence, but rather by virtue of his weakness and his suffering. This is the crucial distinction between Christianity and all religions. Human religiosity directs people in need to the power of God in the world. The Bible directs people towards the powerlessness and suffering of God Only the suffering God can help. If we are the kind of people who are in need enough to hope that the kingdom of God comes into the world, may we learn to recognize the God who is coming to save us in his poverty of spirit, in those who mourn, in those who are meek, in those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, in the merciful, in the pure in heart, in the peacemakers, and those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake.